So mm-hmm. imagine that you're in a car and in the car is an infant, a toddler, a adolescent, a teenager, and like a college age person who's driving right now. So if you're in this really intense reactivity, it's probably like an angry teenager kind of part. And even if you don't know exactly what age, it's like, how old do you feel? If you're feeling terrified and like, you're going to be abandoned, that's probably a little kid age part. If you're feeling super angry and defiant, that's probably a teenage part. So ask yourself before I answer this email, before I respond to this call, whatever the thing is, who's driving the car? Is your present day adult self the one responding? In today's episode of the Unstoppable Woman podcast, we are speaking with Britt Frank. She is a psychotherapist, trauma specialist, and author of a great book, The Science of Stuck, Breaking Through Inertia to Find Your Path Forward, which I cannot wait to talk to her about. She speaks and writes about mental health myths that we're going to dive into that keep you not only stuck, but stressed out. And so I cannot wait to dive into a fabulous conversation with Britt and welcome to the show, Britt. Hi, thank you so much for having, I'm so excited about this. (laughs) Awesome. I love that. Um, So we're just going to go straight into it. I want to talk about trauma. You have a specialty of working with, with people with trauma. And I think that, you know, I have a certain amount of experience with that and perspective on it, but you are by far much more schooled in it. In it and I, I want to pick your brain and see how it applies to women who are running their own businesses and really triangulate how that might be showing up for, for people, even if they haven't necessarily named it as trauma. So that's my, that's my intention from today. So let's talk about trauma. Like what, it, what is it and how does it affect your life? I love that question, right? Because that word gets thrown around, especially nowadays, it's everywhere. It's like, what are are we actually talking about? Okay, so let's define it. So Dr. Peter Levine, who pioneered a trauma modality called somatic experiencing, which is brilliant, and I'm trained in it, and I love it. And he's brilliant. And he defines trauma like this. Trauma is anything that is too much, too fast, or too soon. In other words, trauma is not defined by the events outside of us. Trauma is defined by our brain's metabolizing of the events. In other words, anything that's coming at your brain that is too much, too fast, too soon, or even not enough can get stuck. You know, I think of trauma as brain indigestion. The mechanism is essentially that. It's your brain, for whatever reason, cannot metabolize, cannot break down, cannot process an experience, and so it gets stuck stuck and that shows up as symptoms or anxiety or a sense of unease or not being able to be productive or feeling unmotivated. All of these words that are very shame-based are almost always a response to this thing that's either too much. And if the world is not too much, too fast, too soon in general right now, I don't know what is. And Mm -hmm. starting a business can be incredibly traumatic because everything is coming at you from every direction. Let's dive in there for a moment because What I see a lot is if you haven't done something yet in your life, in your business, but let's talk business here. If you haven't done something yet in your business and your your programming, your set point, your identity says that isn't me or that's going to be hard or I don't know how to do that. There's all sorts of internal self-talk and yet all the results that you want are on the other side of doing that thing but you're getting this trauma response. I'm going to just frame it that way. Mm -hmm. Since that's what we're talking about, you're getting this response that's saying, I'm not ready for that. That's too fast. That's too soon. I need to get ready to get ready to get ready. Right. Like there's all sorts of, I'm going to put it in the framework of stories, right? Like the, the story that we tell ourselves about the experience we're having that um, we have to be respectful of, but I might be in conflict with what you, you think, but like, I have a strong stance that you have to respect that, but also if you want the new result, grow yourself beyond it as, as quickly. And here's where speed comes in as quickly as you can. And oftentimes we, we say to ourselves, and I see it all the time with my clients. So I'm open here, but I see it all the time. I'll do that in three weeks. I'll do that in two months. I'll get to that then. And it's a stalling technique. 
And I, I'm, so I have a little hesitation about someone saying, oh, well, I'm feeling like it's too fast. That must be, I'm in trauma. I need to respect that and not close the gap on time and do the thing a little faster in their business. So back to you. I love that you said that because trauma is not a synonym for an excuse to stay where you are. You know, the trauma explanation is just a way to name what's going on. So if some, and I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business women, you know, women in business as well. It's like, okay, you are not making your sales calls because you're having a trauma response. That doesn't mean don't do it. It means now we have a name for the origin of the stagnation. Now we can move forward. But what happens is when people say, I'll do it in two weeks, I'll do it in a month. That's crap. It's not true. And the fastest way to move through a trauma response is to name it. And what people will say is I shouldn't be this, you know, it's a sales call. I shouldn't be this bothered by it. What's wrong with me? Why? And you know, it's not like anything bad ever happened to me. That's a, such an inefficient use of your time for whatever reason, your brain is shut down. It's locked down in a fear response. If the word trauma is tripping you out, just call it a fear response. Fine. But the way through a fear response, and I'm with you, like we want to get to what we need to get to quickly. Mm -hmm. And the fastest way to get somewhere is to be honest about what it is. A trauma response is not an excuse for inertia, nor is it a reason that you can justify keeping yourself small. It's an explanation. And once you know that trauma is the problem, now we can start intervening with effective solutions because I'm with you. We have no time to waste here. Yeah. So you just said something really interesting. You said trauma, call it a fear response if that's easier for you to like understand. So I think that's really interesting because are all fear responses trauma? Like, are those really truly synonyms? Because like the fear response in a sales call, which is huge, right? Like I had to learn how to get through this just like everyone else is like, I'm going to be rejected or judged and I'm going to be thrown out of the tribe and, uh, you know, I'm going to be eaten by the wolves, right? Like we go into like really core fears around survival, not consciously, but subconsciously. Is that because of the trauma that I experienced in my childhood about asking, like when I teach this, I frame it as like, you've asked for something, you've had a desire in your life, you're a little kid, you ask for something, you're so excited to ask for it. You, you do it with this incredibly big hearted energy. And then your parent, your teacher, whoever it is, bops you on the head and says, how dare you ask this? And I've always framed that, say mom doesn't have money to buy the the ice cream, right? And mom says, what do you always want ice cream for? And you're shamed into feeling like you can't ask for what you want. That that has been like subconscious programming, but you're saying that not only don't just name it as programming, name it as trauma. Like that was a little trauma with a a lowercase t, not necessarily trauma with a uppercase t. That's how I, I, I label trauma. Like trauma is a uppercase t. I don't know if you use this expression, but I think of it as like, okay, you were in the war, right? You were raped, right? Like your house burned down and your baby brother died in it, right? Like trauma, trauma, um, with a capital T versus the smaller, like, I just wanted an ice cream. And she said, what are you thinking? Right. Um, okay. I hand this back to you. (laughs) And, you know, and I am a trauma therapist. What I'm about to say comes from the lens of, I am actually a trauma therapist. And I am saying, if it comes to your business, don't worry about trying to identify the origin. Don't worry about trying to figure out, was it a big T trauma? Was it a little T trauma? Was this because my mom shamed me? When it comes to getting into momentum for the goals and the things we want to do, sometimes it's a, not all the time, but sometimes it's enough just to say, Hey, for whatever reason, my brain feels too afraid to do the thing. So then the question isn't, well, why, and where did it come from? And what happened in your childhood? Then the question is, what are the resources you have right now available to you to make this task safer so we can get moving. And I love introspection and I love, you know, analysis and I love 
digging around in the why and the what, that's great. But if you are just wanting to get a task done, don't ask why, ask what, what will help me feel a little safer? Do I have a, a friend who can be with me while I make this call? Do I have somebody that I can check in with after to make sure that I'm still okay and I haven't been cast out because I risked rejection? When we can change the what happened to me and why am I stuck to what are my choices and of those, what will I say yes to today? Then the question of, was it a big trauma? Was it a little trauma? Whose trauma was it? We don't have to worry about, you know, placing it in the spectrum of, well, it wasn't like I was in the war and it wasn't like I was raped. And so what's wrong with me? It's like, let's just assume your brain is in a fear response. Cool. What will help you feel safe enough to do the task in front of you? And that will get us back into motion a lot faster than trying to analyze you know, when I was three, my father looked at me weirdly when I sang a song and now I can't sing anymore. Like that's great. And that's important, but it's not the starting place. The starting place is what's the thing I want to do that I feel like I can't for whatever reason, what are my options and what am I going to say yes to today? Like that yeah. is an action plan. Yeah. So if trauma is a fear response, then has everyone experienced trauma? So I love that question. And the answer is if you're human to some degree, at some point you're going to, it's like digestion. Like you don't have to be poisoned by your food to have indigestion. And so when I say that everyone at some point experiences trauma, some people get very angry with me and they're like, well, if you're saying that everyone has it, then no one has it. And it's like, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and domestic abuse and all of the big T traumas. And I'm saying not that we're all the same, but that to some degree, everyone's brain is going to be overloaded by something. And COVID was proof positive of that. Nobody could have anticipated that. If you didn't identify as a trauma survivor pre-COVID, you certainly qualify now. And yeah. so it doesn't normalize it as an equal, nor does it excuse anything. It is an explanation. A fear response is a trauma response. And so knowing that that's how our brains are, why our brains are not organized for productivity. They're organized for survival and it's not always mm -hmm. logical. So let's work with our brain's design instead of in opposition to it, but by shaming ourselves yeah. because of it, you know? Yeah. Shame doesn't work for anything. So let's, yeah, let's drop that one like a hot potato. So I have a question for you that you may or may not be able to answer. I learned along my journey that the only two fears that human beings are born into this world with that aren't learned are the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. Have you heard that? I have heard that. I don't know if I buy that, but I do. I've, I've tried heard to that. find like the first the, the primary research on that and uh, my, my, my Google search attempts of that have not been successful. I, there are a lot of articles referencing this concept, but not where the studies were done. So anyways, I, I was just, so you're oh, yeah. not sure if you buy, buy that either. Okay. I'm not, yeah. Because there's epigenetics and studies that show that trauma from your grandparents that they didn't deal with can show up in you as symptoms. And then whatever spiritual beliefs you, you hold about how we come into this world and the origin of where does life. So the, again, the question of what, you know, are the fears learned or are they innate? Were we born with them? Were we trained in them is a really fascinating question. And I'm happy to dive into it. But a better question is, regardless of the origin, you have the fear. So whether it was innate or learned, does it really matter? Knowing the origin of something doesn't necessarily solve your problem. But yeah. knowing I need to find people, places, things, thoughts, behaviors, resources that help me feel safe and competent and make me feel like I have that I can do get up and go yeah. energy. It's a much better place to put our very limited bandwidth. I think it goes in the same category as what you were saying about naming it as trauma, right? Like it's important to name it as trauma. And then what do you do about it? Like if you understand epigenetics and that there are people from your past, your lineage that have had trauma and that can be passed down to you. And we, we know that now it's like, oh, I can name that and go, okay, that's what that is. I still have to take the steps. I still have to ask a better question. I, I can't then fall victim and say, oh, life is happening to me instead of being a creator of one's life. But let's, let's dive into epigenetics a little bit, because I'm not sure that everyone who's listening has that knowledge. My understanding of it, and you probably know it better than I do, is that they've done these studies where, um, like with 
with rats, they can give them an experience and um, some of it's trauma, some of it's not. And then their offspring who have not experienced the same thing will have the same response to this experience that they've never had before that their great, great, great grandfather rat had, right? And I forget what the study was, but it was like they got electrocuted every time they had X experience. And then the, the offspring have that same response, even though they've, they've never been trained to have this response. So I found that fascinating. Do I have that correct? Yeah, well left? said. I think the rat study was they got electric shocks every time they smelled cherry blossoms. And then they found that, you know, the offspring three generations later who have never been exposed to cherry blossoms would have a fear response. And Dr. Rachel Yehuda has done fascinating studies about Holocaust survivors that the PTSD symptoms were showing up two, three generations after the fact. And so someone might all of a sudden quote for no reason them be sitting and having a panic episode and think that they're crazy. But it's like, well, if you two generations ago had our grandparent who was in a concentration camp, we know that that type of symptomology can show up in you. But again, though, why am I panicking for no reason is not a good starting place. Like we can figure out that stuff later. A good starting place is assume that any fear response of any kind from any origin, they all have the same solution create a sense of safety for your brain, create a community of support and resources and people that you're connected to a brain that feels safe is not going to get stuck on a task. So regardless of the origin, assume the problem is a fear response. Even if logically, you don't know why, like whether Mm -hmm. it's five generations ago, or because when you were a baby, there was a loud noise. And now every time you hear a horn, you panic, it doesn't totally matter. Our stories matter, but the origin of a symptom is you don't need to know it to heal from it. It's like, okay, great. Car horns freak you out. What will make you feel safer? And with business, if sales calls freak you out because you're afraid of rejection, great. Find a safe person that can sit with you while you do that. So you can give your brain a reparative experience. Because what we also know about the brain is it heals and it changes and it's plastic and you can build new neural pathways. So if a task freaks you out, find a safe way to get it done, repeat it. And then over time, now that's your association. Yeah. Repetition is the mother skill. You know, I, I constantly share that with my clients. Like you, you don't just expect to do things once and have mastery. Don't expect to just listen to something once and have mastery to it. Like the level of mastery that I've been able to create in my life and my business in the areas that I've created it in is because I repeat and yeah. And one of the things that I, I'm curious to hear what you think of this technique from your, your expert perception, this is just something that I created for myself. So I would notice that I would be having sort of a Skype exchange or a phone exchange, text, whatever, some sort of medium, and I would be triggered. Okay. So I was in some sort of trauma response. It was automatic. Maybe I started to cry. Maybe I started to get anxious or angry, or there was some kind of response, which was, I call it being thrown out of heaven, right? Like I'm in my good place and now I'm not. And look at that. And what's going on. Okay. Um, And what I would do is I would go back and I would read the, generally this was something that was written. So I would go back and I would read the exchange, whether it was an email exchange or S- Skype. Like I remember when I was first starting my business and like you piss off a client and it's the worst thing ever, right? Like you're, you want to crawl under the table in a little ball and never like um, leave again, right? And, and I would go back and I would read it and I would, I would read it and I would have the trauma response again, shame response, um, fear response, whatever you want to call that, right? That, that being thrown out of heaven, I'd breathe. And then I would read it again. And I would figure out when the first, like what aspect of that, that I was reading, what was the first hook? Okay. And I would pause there and I would keep reading it until that hook no longer hooked me. And then I would keep going and I would do it again and again until I got to a place where I could read it. And I 
wasn't triggered into ch- tears, fear, whatever, anxiety about it. I was just like, this is what is going on. And it wasn't a full body experience, from, like a negative kind of freak out. And that's been incredibly useful to me. And I've taught my clients to do that um, in small and large ways. What do you think that is? Because I just made that made that shit up myself, right? But it was like how I could like reprocess. I didn't want to just run away from the experience. I wanted to to remap it for myself and reprocess it for myself. And I know I I was using my intellect as I was reading it and trying to figure out what the perspective was and the reframe and what this really meant and all of that. So Well, I love that. And what you're talking about is exposure therapy. And I'm a big fan of make shit up. Like anything, you know, exposure therapy, the idea of repeating exposure to a frightening thing over and over and over again until it no longer holds a charge. That's one of many ways of getting past the fear response. If that works, that's awesome. Does it generally work? Because I never actually framed, Britt, I never actually framed that as exposure, like exposure therapy. I never labeled it that. And my understanding of exposure therapy is that it's kind of been called bunk. Um, like if you're afraid of snakes, put yourself in front of snakes, like that it doesn't actually work particularly well. Am, am I wrong about that? This works for me. So, um, so here's maybe it the does thing work. with exposure therapy. There is a lot of debate and a lot of people screaming, don't do it. Don't do it. It's crap. You know, all you're doing is creating more of a freeze response and you're numbing yourself. For some people in some situations, that might very well be true. There are some things where if I just expose myself to them, I'm essentially invalidating my experience. But when it comes to what you're talking about, if doing that works, then it works. It's our humanity is so nuanced and so complex that as long as what you're doing isn't hurting someone, I think there is a spot at the table for pretty much every type of healing modality, including exposure therapy, as long as you're aware of its limitations. So let's say for one of your clients, they try that and it doesn't work. It's like, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just for them, exposure therapy doesn't work. Great. We can try cognitive therapy and working with your thoughts. If that doesn't work, great. We can try a body-based therapy where like, as you read it, you smell something pleasant and we try to create a positive association. The good news is if something isn't working, it's not because you're deficient and it's not necessarily because that's a bad technique. It's just for you. It works for me. It may not. Cool. There is a huge buffet of available things. Plus you can make up whatever you need in the moment. So I'm, I, if that works awesome. And it sounds like for you and for your clients, it works. So I would never say an an entire body of therapy is bunk unless it's causing harm. If, unless people are uninformed, but if it works, do it. I do lots of weird shit in my (laughs) therapy, self-healing practices that people think are bananas, but they work for me. You know, might not work for you, but that's okay. You get to practice and play and make it up. I love it. I love it. One of the things that I I really practice and I share with some of my private clients is using this feeling state that you have to make better decisions about the example that I'm going to give you is like when writing an email, like when I was doing a lot of private coaching with people, they would send me like their emails, like, is this going to like, how would you respond to this? And what I would do for myself and what I would train my clients to do. And I think it's a really interesting way of working with what you're calling the trauma response. And I was just calling feelings. Okay. Um, Is to read the, the email. It just sort of in the same way that I was talking about, like if you, you had an exchange, but this is just like what you're writing, your, your response back is to read the email and figure out where, where you get the hook. Okay. And that is an interesting way of using the trauma response in a really positive way, because that that's what you need to remap. That's not working for you. That's reinforcing the old way of being the old um, pattern, the old dysfunction. And it can be, you know, I often see it in sort of justification or blaming or pointing fingers or, uh, defensiveness or, and it, and it comes out in how people write and how people frame things. And it's been an incredibly useful tool for me personally, because I, I wouldn't send an email until I, got to a place where I could read the whole thing and I wasn't hooked and I felt good about it. 
And that's one of the key things that allowed me to move through old identity patterns, old programming, old fear responses, and become someone who wasn't that anymore without, without making it wrong, without shaming myself, but just in a very positive way, like looking at it and going, oh, that, that doesn't make me feel good. I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to avoid it, right? Because that makes me feel bad also, but I'm going to figure out how to frame it in a way where I'm, I'm all good with what I just said, right? And not in a like, well, I'm all good. Like I have to defend myself, but like all good. Like I feel like I am the person I want to be right now. And that's been a huge, huge technique that I've used. And it, uh, I think that our, the audience listening could use that not just in emails, but if you're feeling that trauma response, if you're feeling that reactivity, then who do you want to be right now in that, that moment? Uh, I love that. that. And I actually have an exercise along the same lines. So, you know, we know that inside of us, we're the sum total of every age we've ever been. Right. So Mm -hmm. imagine that you're in a car and in the car is an infant, a toddler, adolescent, a teenager, and like a college age person who's driving right now. So if you're in this really intense reactivity, it's probably like an angry teenager kind of part. And even if you don't know exactly what age it's like, how old do you feel? If you're feeling terrified and like, you're going to be abandoned, that's probably a little kid age part. If you're feeling super angry and defiant, that's probably a teenage part. So ask yourself before I answer this email, before I respond to this call, whatever the thing is, who's driving the car is your present day adult self, the one responding. And if the answer is no, no problem, but like, let's take a second and reorient. And if we can learn to observe what we're doing before we do it, then we can ask ourselves who's driving. And if it's not our adult self who can have perspective and have regulation and all of that again no shame but don't respond to anything until you are the adult driving the car we love your inner child part and your inner teen part but we don't want them running your business yeah no i love that that's a that's a super helpful technique i want to go back to something you wrote that you know the body doesn't lie and i've used that expression myself and how do we know when So like I'm using that in, in this technique, right. And, and like, who's driving the car, like you can feel it differently in the body. Um, how do we know if it's our inner three-year-old or, you know, hormones or blood sugar levels or, um, any other sort of chemical hormonal shifts in our body, like not enough sleep, whatever it is, like, how do we place that? I'm so glad you asked that because sometimes like a, a broken knee is a broken knee. Like sometimes it's not trauma. Sometimes it just is what it is. And so Dr. Levine says this too, like first rule out organic bio stuff. So like before you start working with your inner child, ask yourself, have I eaten food? Have I drank water? Have I slept? And if you're concerned about hormones, then go cheers, go check those out, like always rule out and whatever type of therapy or therapist you're working with, if you choose to any ethical therapist will tell you, if you have a thing first, make sure there's not an organic thing cause like when I got COVID in 2020. And if I'm like, this is my inner child, it's like, no, I have a virus that is creating havoc in my nervous system. And a lot of the COVID symptoms were nervous system based, like restless legs and weird anxiety, things that came out of nowhere and full body tremors, things that had no definable childhood origin. It's a virus. So I love that you named that like, okay, so the, the order of operation here is first, let's try basic bio needs, sleep, food, water, fine. Then are there more complex medical things going on? Check. Then we can get into some more of these like more esoteric inner healing, psychological concepts that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, I love that. And when you say looking at hormones, like as a female in the 21st century living in the United States, I recognize that my hormones are like sometimes run in the freaking show. Okay. And I don't know, actually always know when it's my hormones or not my hormones. Are you suggesting we get uh, hormonal testing in some sort or tracking or how, how do you, how do you personally 
like I understand, okay, let's drink a glass of water. Let's make sure we're not thirsty. Let's make sure we, we've eaten. Those are like, I, I know how to do that as a non-trained uh, human in this world, right? Nice. I, I've been trained how to drink and eat. So I got those two things covered, but like, how do you, how do you recognize if something is hormonal versus trauma? And I'm not a physician. So I tell all yeah. my clients, if you're worried about your thyroid, go get your thyroid checked. If you're worried mm -hmm. about your levels of estrogen, go get your levels checked. So I I'm certainly not here to try to tell someone it's hormones versus it's trauma as a non-medical provider. I'm a mental health yeah. provider. My first thing is if you're concerned about a medical issue, go to someone to, you know, who specializes in that area. Okay. Yeah. And then you can rule it out. And not everyone has access to that type of medical treatment, but if you have the option to rule out a hormonal imbalance, go do that. But even if it is your hormones, even if it is physiological and chemical, nevertheless, your brain still needs to understand who, what, where, and when makes me feel safe. And if nothing else, mm -hmm. addressing these safety trauma related things are going to, at the very least, take the edge off of the physiological things that are going on. They don't solve the problem, mm -hmm. but they can certainly yeah. exacerbate the problem. So if we can deal with this, deal with this and then get this checked. Yeah. What do you think creates safety? Mm, I love that so much. And the yeah. answer really for different people on different days, you know, on some days for me, safety is I'm alone in my room with my dog and my shows that I watch a thousand times over and over again. And on some days it's, I need connection with my, like my female friends who are all running their own empires. And on some days I need my husband to hug me. And on some days I need to cry. So, you know, really the what creates safety is a very honest inventory of what do you value? How are you wired? What for you creates safety? Because if you try to hug me on a day where I need to be alone, that's not going to be safe. I'm going to get super angry and hostile, but I know myself <laughs> well enough now to know, do I need to be alone? Do I need to be with people? Do I need quiet or do I need stipulation? Do I need something that brings my system up or do I need something that brings my system down. And those are very quick inventory, like questions that you can ask yourself. If you're triggered, do I need up or down? Do I need a loner people? Like that's a great starting place. If you're trying to create safety. Yeah. A loner people. I, I love that. And that's a great litmus test there. Okay. So let's shift gears here and talk about how people manage, like, do some people manage their trauma better than others? The answer is going to be yes, I would assume. Okay. But I, I'm curious about like folks who have had trauma, it creates a bit of a shadow side, right? It creates some darkness um, and that some people are able to turn that darkness into a great power, benevolent power, pow positive power. And some people aren't, they're really, you know, held back and they stay stuck in the shadow. So I guess my first question there is, is there a risk to tapping into the shadow and re really bringing that forward and using it for you versus against you. And I love shadow work. I am such a fan of like, let's go to the darkest sides of the psyche and integrate those hidden places. However, yeah. the caveat is if you don't have an environment that can support that level of internal digging, then don't do it. Then it's not safe. You know, I have people that come to me for therapy very earnestly saying, I want to go to my shadow parts and I want to get to the dark side of my psyche and unearth this hidden, you know, mine of energy so I can mobilize. It's like, great. But right now you don't know where you're going to live and you're in the middle of this horrible divorce from an abusive person and your environment can't sustain that type of inner exploration. And so I think the first question is, is the type of inner work I'm wanting to do, is that going to be supported by my environment? And if the answer is no, fine, find a different type of work to do, find a different task, find a different you know, just pivot and do something different. But I think the thing that prohibits some people, if you're asking, why do some people get better? And why do some people not, you know, the things that keep us stuck are either fear, comfort, 
that's a biggie, right? Like if you're comfortable enough in your misery and the, the, the pain of the change process is unappealing because you're too comfortable, you're not going to change, but it's either fear it's comfort or if it's, or it's lack of access, you know, there's a lot of systemic things that are set up for people not to be able to heal. And that's not an internal problem. That's a systemic issue, but you know, why do some people take their trauma and triumph? And why do some people take their trauma and fall apart? That's going to come down to a lot of reasons, including genetics, environment, safety, access, privilege, the list goes on and on. Um, yeah. So asking yourself, can I turn my trauma into something else? What are my, re again, going back to what are my resources? What are my choices? And of those choices, what will I say yes to today? Every big change is the product of a thousand little yeses. Yeah, hundred percent. Choices are greatest power. Okay, so let's talk about your book, The Science of Stuck. So first, what inspired you to write the book and who is it for? Oh, I love that. So I've always wanted to write ever since I was little, I would like write my little fake books and whatever. So I've, and I think everyone has a book in them at some point. I decided to write this book because after I started accumulating just notebooks and folders and files and a bajillion Instagram posts of mental health information, it occurred to me that we all have a giant stack of self-help books sitting around and no bandwidth to read them all. So what if there was one book that sort of summarized all of the things gave you just the bottom. Like I, again, I love a deep dive, but when I was 21, I wish someone had given me one book and said, here are just a few things that you need to know about your brain, about anxiety, about relationships, about boundaries, about friendships. If you can start with these pieces of information, you can get yourself moving and we'll do deep dive exploration later. So I wrote the book because I had an incredible wealth of info and I'm a big show and tell kind of gal. And I wrote the book for my younger self because she really needed that book and it didn't exist then. I love it. I love it. Give us one, one example of someone who could really benefit from this book, like in a kind of case study kind of way, like if you're experiencing X, Y, and Z so that people understand, like, this is for me, if I'm, I'm having this kind of experience. Sure. The things I hear most in my practice from clients are whatever the struggle is, I'm lazy. I'm crazy. I struggle with motivation. I struggle with procrastination. And those things are, they're not accurate words. Like the dilemma is real. I get that there are things that we do that annihilate our sanity and destroy our lives and prohibit us from achieving the things we want, but laziness and procrastination and lack of motivation are not brain states. So if you've ever thought to yourself, I really struggle with motivation, the book's for you. If you've ever thought to yourself, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just, I seem so lazy sometimes. I just can't do, I know what I should do. And somehow there's this gap between what I know and what I'm doing. What the hell is wrong with me? The book is for you. It's like brain science 101. It's driver's ed for your, you know, the bodies that we live in so that you can just bottom line, you know, understand just a few pieces of information and then you can get moving. And then I we can find, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, those are really concrete. So before I ask my last questions, where can people find you and find your book? So I spend a lot of time on Instagram, more time than I care to admit. It's just my name at Britt Frank and Britt has two T's and you can buy the book wherever you can buy books and more info about that is at scienceofstuck.com. Great, I love it, I love it. Okay, so for yourself, my woman it has a growth mindset. She's always bettering her best. She's always growing. My clients are like taking that to the next level. They're fast tracking things, right? They're like committed to their growth. So I, I like to ask my guests, how are you committed to upping your game? Like, what do you do on the freaking regular to keep growing? I love, okay. So I don't know who said this. I wish I did so I could attribute credit, but the quote is if you're always the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And so for me, I love surrounding myself with 
really powerful, strong. I, you know, I have a lot of women friends. It's not just a women thing, but for me, I love surrounding myself with powerful women who know more than I do, who think things differently than the way I do. So I can learn from them because again, if, in order to grow, you need to surround yourself with people that have something that you want or have done something that you want to do, or who know something that you may not know. So I am committed to my growth by mentors, teachers, having really, really amazing friends doing incredible work in the world and then asking questions. And the more I know, the more I realize that I don't know anything. So it's great <laughs> to stay in a student mindset, no matter how big or how powerful you get, which is great. Celebrate the crap out of yourself and hold space for, there's a lot I don't know and a lot I have to learn. And I desire to learn all that I can so I can be the fullness of who I can be. I freaking love it. I love that. Okay. My next question what makes you an unstoppable woman? I love your work so much. What makes me an unstoppable woman is I am committed to staying uh, in connection with all parts of myself, including the ones that are not particularly shiny, because the more connected you are to yourself, the more power you have. You are pretty much unstoppable if you are willing to get to know all aspects of yourself, the good, the bad, the really bad, and everything in between. The more connection we have with our own system, the more power we're going to have to go out into the world because we don't, it takes a lot of energy to live split. Oh, I hate the part of me that does drugs. I hate the part of me that gossips. I hate the part of me that's envious. Well, that takes a lot of energy to keep yourself split off from those parts. So don't subscribe to their behaviors, but welcome those parts home. Just assume you've got a car full of amazing parts of your psyche and all of them, if you can welcome them in the spirit of hospitality and curiosity, have a gift for you. And that will make you unstoppable. Mm, I love that. I love that. Um, so I just want to share a few reflections with you, Britt. This has been such a great conversation. I love the energy that you have, you bring to the conversation and that level of truth, right? Like that it's not all shiny and perfect, perfect, that it is about this, this integration and acceptance. And that really is a powerful stance that, that I hope people pay attention to because shame says you you're wrong right shame says you know there is something wrong with me and guilt says i've done something wrong and those two things just keep you stuck speaking of the science of getting unstuck right like the shame and the guilt keep you stuck and if you can instead welcome not in a i want more but welcome in a like that curiosity place that you just mentioned it's a huge shift in the energy and it, it frees up so much energy. So thank you for bringing that to the table and for being unstoppable and sharing your wisdom. It's been great to have you here. Thank you so much. This was fun. Hey, thanks so much for joining us and being part of the Unstoppable Woman movement. We have got a ton of free resources for scaling your business at theunstoppablewoman.com slash free stuff. And you can find that link in the description below. So go ahead and check those out. And we'd also love your help in getting our message out to more and more women. If you'd be willing to share this video with all the unstoppable women in your life, that would be fantastic. And while you're at it, hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Reviews, likes, and comments are greatly appreciated. We go in and read them all. So thank you for those. And thanks for listening and be unstoppable.